Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. Preparing this talk is giving me a welcome excuse to spend some time in my garden. And in this talk, I'd like to weave together the biology and history of some common garden plants in order to explore how we can garden not just for ourselves, but also in support of conservation. At the end, I'll share some of the references that I found useful for thinking and learning about garden plants. But before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I live and work on the unceded territory of Tecumloops Te Shekwekmek within Shekwekmek Ulu. I thank the Shekwekmek Nation for their hospitality and I'm extraordinarily grateful for all those who have cared for its ecosystems. Thinking about this, one of the ideas that I'd like to explore in the talk is this. What we humans do with plants matters. The planet may be blue, but the world is green. By weight, those living rooted beings we call plants, they make up 80% of the world's terrestrial biomass. Yet even though intellectually we know that plants matter, they are after all the base of all terrestrial food chains, as a society, we increasingly suffer from what has been called plant blindness. Defined in 1999, plant blindness is described as the inability to notice plants in one's environment or to appreciate their unique biology. Today, many conservation biologists worry that plant blindness will impede our ability to cultivate the care that is necessary for plant conservation. It was in light of this several years ago that I began a project called the Expeditionary Art of Home. As a plant ecologist, I had been trained to use field journals as a tool to help pay attention to the green world. And I wondered if I couldn't work that we use the work in these journals to help celebrate and draw attention to the plants we can find in the natural ecosystems of the South Thompson watershed. This project resulted in an exhibit featuring both my field journals and larger works that I called field journal paintings that traveled throughout BC and Alberta for several years, including a show here in Kamloops. But this spring, when the coronavirus arrived in our region, my access to the natural areas surrounding Kamloops, like all of yours, became severely curtailed. On March 17th, when I woke up and I could no longer go to work as I normally did, I had the view out my window and I had my garden. I was not alone. We've all seen the media reports. North Americans, when confronted with the arrival of a novel virus on our shores, we bought first toilet paper and then seeds. Some seed suppliers had to temporarily shut down their online stores. Closer to home, West Coast Seeds, the seed supplier I normally order from, reported that this spring their orders surged 7 to 10 times their normal, normal daily level. I come from a long line of gardeners and my family almost always grows a few vegetables and a lot of flowers. Our garden is probably best described as a bit haphazard and a lot rambunctious. But I have to admit that over the last 15 years of gardening in one place, it's been easy for me to take my home garden for granted as somewhere that I pass through en route to get to the field. But this spring, this, this 50 by 120 foot lot in downtown Kamloops became the field. And it's not that I hadn't spent some time in it. Flipping through my field journals, I have scattered drawings from my garden, images drawn as a short relief from larger projects or during lazy weekend mornings. But I'd rarely thought about my garden as a whole, as an assemblage of plants that deserve the same kind of attention that I would normally give the plants that grow in natural areas outside Kamloops. I wasn't even sure I could make name all of its plants. So being a botanist, I made a list. Beginning such a list, however, immediately raises the question of how to name plants. There is no wrong and right way, but scientifically, all living species are given two-part names. 
Our common ponderosa pine tree carries the scientific name Pinus ponderosa and is one species among many in the genus Pinus. In gardens, species taxonomy is often complicated with human-created cultivars or hybrids, so as a first estimate, I decided to not count species but merely the genera, with the caveat that if an individual genus, say Rosa, had both a cultivated and a non-cultivated species in my garden, I would list both. The result? 125 different plants. I was shocked. From previous sampling with my students in the Lac de Bois grassland just north of Kamloops, I knew that the maximum number of species we'd ever found in a similar size plot was 60, less than half, and many of those individual species were in the same genera. Others, however, have observed similar patterns. Numerous species have found that the diversity of urban yards can surpass the plant diversity found in the surrounding natural vegetation. Some of my garden's diversity predates me. Most of the trees, including an unusual ginkgo tree, and the cherries that each year overwhelm our ability to process them were already in place by the time I came to know my garden. Other species, other genera like foxgloves and gallardia, we planted ourselves. But seeing this list of garden genera made me wonder what else I've been missing by taking my garden for granted. Take rhubarb for instance. In my garden, it's crammed into a corner. Each spring, it's one of the first plants to produce edible food. But other, other than the occasional rhubarb tarts my husband makes for our family, I've been surprisingly adept at ignoring both its biology and its history. But rhubarb, like all plants, has lessons to teach. First and foremost among its lessons is that its very existence represents a way of life that is deeply alien to the one we inhabit in our animal bodies. What do I mean by alien? Ask most school children what is the difference between plants and animals and they will quickly tell you that animals eat and plants photosynthesize. And they're right. Contained within the cells of nearly all land plants are the small green organelles called chloroplasts that allow land plants to use the energy of the sun to spin sugars from carbon dioxide and water. Chloroplasts, however, are not a plant inven invention. They are instead the descendants of once free-living photosynthetic bacteria that have entered into a symbiotic relationship within land plants. We know that chloroplasts exist. Few of us, however, get to see them or the other plant structures that fo facilitate photosynthesis. However, if we take fresh rhubarb leaves into the lab, we can peel back the epidermis of the leaf and under a microscope, we can see, clearly see the green oblong shapes of chloroplasts circled here in red on the left. And then, if we focus not on photosynthetic cells, but on the leaf epidermis, we can also see the small pores called stomata, circled in red on the right, through which plants inhale carbon dioxide. Of course, there's more. Carbon dioxide enters the leaf via stomata, but water must be absorbed from the soil via the root. How then does water get from root to leaf? When we cut thin sections of a rhubarb leaf stem, technically called a petiole, and then we stain it with a chemical dye and look through the microscope, we can see the blue ring cells circled in red. These blue ring cells are called xylem, and these cells are the, the pipes through which water travels from root to leaf. Plants are thus energized by the chemical wizardry of their bacterial passengers. This fundamental difference between plants and, and animals reverberates throughout their biology. First, how we acquire energy, it turns out, is a driving force shaping our bodies. The wonderful French botanist Francis Halley describes plants as vast fixed surfaces in comparisons with animals' small mobile volumes. All plants, big or small, privilege surface area at the cost of volume. Let me explain why with an example drawn directly from Halley's books in Praise of Plants. Imagine you went out for a quick lunch of a cheeseburger, french fries, and a milkshake. The, the 
energy available in this lunch is approximately 1500 calories. Of course, the cost of digesting the meal means that its efficiency is only approximately 30, 30%. But still, for animals like us, this means that it can take as little as 10 minutes for us to access 500 calories worth of energy. What about plants with their photosynthet photosynthetic chloroplasts? Botanist David Lee has done the same type of an analysis. Imagine that we have a plant living in Di Miami, where David lives, with a photosynthetic surface the same size as a beach umbrella, approximately two meters squared. At midday in the summer in Miami, Lee explains, radiation would strike this surface of the earth at about one kilowatt per square meter, and a half of that light could be used for photosynthesis. If we do some simple conversions, we find that one kilojoule is equivalent to 0 0.239 calories. If that umbrella plant of ours was a perfect absorber, it would take 105 minutes of photosynthesis to capture the same calories we can eat in a 10 minute lunch. However, no plant is a perfect absorber. Um, due to light interception, the biochemical cost of photosynthesis, plants efficiency at capturing light is actually less than 3%. Thus, Lee explains, it would be necessary for um, our umbrella plant to photosynthesize for more than two full days in order to access the same amount of energy that we can get in a 10-minute lunch. Mm. Thus, the main organ of plants found above ground, its shoot, has been selected to maximize its surface area in order to facilitate the absorption of sunlight and carbon dioxide. Moving large surface is always problematic and David Lee writes that evolutionarily, it's much better if you're a plant to grow as big an umbrella as possible, keep it pointed at the sun and stop walking around. Below ground, plant roots maximize their surface area in order to facilitate the absorption of water and mineral nutrients. Of course, in the game of evolution, there's multiple opportunities and constraints. Constrained by their rootedness, a rhubarb plant can't pick up its roots and shuffle off to the plant equivalent of a singles bar when it's time to find a mate. Instead, the second lesson rhubarb has to teach us is that sometimes love needs a little help. Rhubarb produces small flowers on tall stalks and relies on the wind to disperse its sperm, neatly packaged in the tiny vehicles that we call pollen, from one plant to another. Other species, like the spaghetti squash I grow each summer, rely on the mobile help of animals to transfer pollen from one flower to the next. The third lesson plants have to teach us is that protection comes in multiple forms. Unlike animals, plants can't run, slide, swim, or fly away when threatened, but that doesn't mean they're defenseless. Many species of plants wear thorns or prickles to deter their predators, but understanding the true nature of plant defenses means backing up and considering the question, how does a carrot pee? Producing waste, after all, is part of being alive. We animals can leave our waste behind, but rooted plants can't. Instead, nestled within each plant cell is a single membrane-bound sac called the vacuole, after the Latin word for an empty space, because when viewed through a microscope, vacuoles can appear empty. They are anything but. Within plant cells, vacuoles, and there can be multiple vacuoles within a single cell, these membrane-bound sacs are filled with watery liquid containing anything that a want, plant wants to store, including its waste. How does a carrot pee? Carrots, like all plants, pee internally into their vacuoles. For many years, biologists called some of the chemicals contained within vacuoles secondary metabolites because they were believed to be only the byproduct of plants' primary metabolic processes, photosynthesis and respiration, and that they had little other purpose in the plant. We now understand that these secondary metabolites are integral to the life of plants, and not all are restricted to the vacuole. 
Some toughen plant cell walls, other can, others can be volatized and released from the plant, serving as forms of chemical communication, gossip that floats on the wind from one plant to another. Still other secondary metabolites color flower petals blue or purple. More toxic ones, like tannins and nicotine, remain sequestered in vacuoles where their very toxicity serves as deterrence for plant predators. In the evolutionary tree of life, if we view animals as the evolutionary life form that has conquered mobility, plants are the life form that have mastered biochemistry. But just as plants co-opt animal mobility for their own purposes, animals rely upon plants' biochemistry. And as a species, we humans eat plants not just for their primary metabolites, their sugars and proteins and fats, fats, but we have also long relied on their secondary metabolites to treat our physical ailments, alter our consciousness, and flavor our food. In particular, over the last 500 years, our desire for secondary metabolites of particular plant species has literally reshaped the world. When Columbus sailed west across the Atlantic Ocean, he was searching for new routes of access to the plants known for their secondary metabolites, spices like cloves and cardamom, cinnamon and nutmeg. The desire for these plant secondary metabolites and the profits that could result was an early engine of globalization and drove Western, European, Western Europe's imperial project. For several hundred years, botany was big business, intent on bioprospecting the world for plants that could be commodified into profit. If the quest for secondary metabolites of spices initially drove this bioprospecting, Europeans soon realized that the value of other New World plants, plants that could be transplanted and grown in fields or gardens across the world. This mixing of plant species was part of what historian Alfred Crosby has termed the Columbian Exchange. My gardens, garlic, lettuce, spinach, peaches, cherries, and pears first arrived in the New World in 1493 on Columbus's second voyage. In contrast, the potatoes, tomatoes, and chili peppers in my gardens were all plants of the Americas that first went east before returning to North America as domesticated crops. It is hard to overstate the ecological and cultural consequence that arose from the Columbian Exchange. It may have started with the desire for new or different plants, but it did not end there. Farmers from the 16th century onward had a greater diversity of crops from which to choose, and people picked the plants that would work best in any one ecosystem, incorporating them into already established farming systems. Globally, food production increased and human populations followed. Of course, as we all now understand all too well, when we humans travel, our disease travels with us. Packed in alongside their crops and livestock, Europeans carried smallpox, measles, typhus, and cholera to the New World, with catastrophic results for the indigenous people. Recent estimates indicate that 80 to 95 percent of the New World indigenous population, approximately 50 million people, perished in the wake of European arrival in the New World. Imagine the silence that must have fallen. How we humans think or feel about plants affects not just them, but us too. Yet in recent years, as our attention has wandered, we've forgotten the stories our garden plants carry. Take poor rhubarb. I may not pay much attention to it, but others know it as a deeply storied plant. As a genus, rhubarb, also known as Rheum, contains approximately 60 species, including the majestic noble Rheum, which I would very much love to see one day. Most of the, the species of this genus, however, are native to Eastern Europe, Southern and Eastern temperate Asia, 
and in the center of this range, particular species of rhubarb have long been valued for their medicinal use. Small doses were used to treat diarrhea. Higher or larger doses were used as a laxative or a medic. In the Middle Ages, demand for rhubarb exploded in Europe, and by the 1600s, the most expensive purges in Italian apothecaries were all made with rhubarb. The economic value of rhubarb meant that during this time in the 1600s, there were botanists in England hard at work trying to grow medicinally potent rhubarb, while at the same time, Peasants in Siberia were working for state-funded convoys searching for new localities of rhubarb. Nobody, however, wanted rhubarb stems, the stems that we normally use to fill our pies and make jams with. What everyone wanted was rhubarb root, particularly whether they knew it or not, they were after the, rub the root of rheum palmatum. Widespread use of rhubarb as a food, or what some references call a dessert vegetable, did not occur until the Colombian exchange brought sugar to the Caribbean and its subsequent large-scale, if inhumane, and slave-based cultivation made sugar both less expensive and much more widely available in Europe. By the 19th century, however, rhubarb had become a culinary fashion in England, especially after gardeners discovered that they could force rhubarb stalks to emerge as early as January. Rhubarb arrived in North America in the late 18th century and over time experienced a surge of popularity before peaking in the 1920s and 1930s. What I think about today looking at the rhubarb in my garden is how this genus has long been caught in a web of human desire that transformed it from an independent plant to a medical commodity to culinary fashion before falling back from favor into the odd corners of our garden. How we humans feel about plants reverberate both through individual species' lives and through larger ecosystems. The attention we give plants matters because no animal has had a greater influence on the green world than we humans. For the last 10,000 years, we humans have been replanting the world, one field, one clear cut, one garden at a time. And in doing so, we privilege some plants over others. Since the dawn of human civilization, the total number of trees in the world has declined by nearly one half. In comparison, agricultural lands, either cropland or pasture, now make up the single largest biome on the earth, covering nearly 40% of the earth's ice-free surface. Today, one of our most pressing conservation questions is whether we humans can make space for plants that fulfill not just our needs, but the needs of the other species with whom we share the ecosystems we call homes. The famed biologist E.O. Wilson once called insects the little things that run the world. In the terrestrial ecosystems, insects are the buzzing, walking, creeping, flying link between plants and larger vertebrates. My entomologist colleague Rob Higgins estimates that the South Thompson is home to anywhere between seven and 10,000 species of insects. According to B. taxonomist Lincoln Best, at least 350 species of these are native bees. If we've been bad for some plants, we've been as bad for insects. Globally, 40% of insects have declined in the past decade, likely due to agricultural intensification, especially with its use of high chemical pesticides, as well as due to urbanization and climate change. All of this puts the diversity of plants that I cultivate in my garden into a broader perspective. Not only are agricultural lands the largest biome in the world, but in North America, turf grasses, like those found in our lawns, now cover three times as much area as any other irrigated crop. For the last several years, I've been weeding the lawn from my garden one strip at a time in favor of plants that I know are friendly to, to local insects, especially native bees. Using two main references, the Xerxes Society's 100 Plants to Feed the Bees and Lori Wiedenhammer's A Victory Garden for Bees, I've privileged those plants known to provide either pollen, nectar, or nesting material for bees. And in response, they've come. 
In the summer of 2017, when our valley was filled with smoke from forest fires, I have to say nothing was more reassuring than going out to my garden and finding a group of hairy belly bees busy on my basil or waking up to find male longhorn bees snuggled into a sunflower. And of course, my garden is not the only garden to support the bees. For the last several years, students in my lab and I have worked in collaboration with Elaine Sedgman and the Thompson Shushwap Master Gardeners to monitor pollinators, both in our cultivated gardens and in nearby natural areas or uncultivated areas. Um, using a citizen science approach, over the course of the last three summers, we completed more than 350 standardized surveys and observed more than 10,000 pollinators in Kamloops. By numbers alone, our work documented more pollinators in cultivated areas, in cultivated gardens, than in nearby uncultivated areas. And this isn't that surprising given that we modify our gardens we, uh, by irrigating them and also typically gardens will often have a higher density of flowers than what's found in natural areas. But the net result is that our gardens, if we make sure to plant pollinator friendly species, our gardens can provide habitat for more than just us. However, there is an important ecological caveat I need to make here. All of the plants in our gardens come from somewhere. An ecologist called the species that could potentially appear in any one region the species pool. In urbanized landscapes, like our gardens, there are three components to the species pool. First, there are the plants that are, would be found normally in the surrounding natural ecosystems. Second are the plants that some ecologists refer to as spontaneous. These are the ones that appear in urban landscapes without any direct planting or intervention by humans. Sometimes these species can be considered weeds, um, and some are some of these spontaneous um, species can also be ones that migrate from the surrounding natural ecosystems. Third are the species that we cultivate. In my garden, as you might expect, the vast majority, 97 of the 125 different plants that I counted, are cultivated species or cultivated plants. These are plants that are only present in my garden because I planted them, or somebody else planted them, and I have continued to maintain them. And like spontaneous species, the origin of these cultivated species varies. Some are native to North America, many more are native to far more distant regions. But here's the thing. Recent research has shown that across large regions of North America and Europe, cultivated species that are found in our garden are surprisingly similar. They exhibit far more homogeneity than the species that were surveyed in the natural ecosystems. As we have been replanting the world one garden at a time, we've largely been planting the same thing. Why does this matter? It matters because my garden, like your garden, was once habitat for the species that co-evolved with the plants that originally grew on this land. In this slide, you can see an aerial photograph in the upper left-hand corner dating from 1928 that shows 1104 Pine Street, my garden, as grassland. My garden is part of the world that we've been replanting. Last summer, as part of the citizen, our citizen science bee monitoring project, we also surveyed natural area for bees and found that even within our limited trapping time, we recorded an extraordinary diversity of native bees, including 15 of all of the 32 bumblebees known to occur in British Columbia. The important point here is that many of these native bee species, unlike the European honeybee, have a life cycle that has evolved to be active and to be very dependent when its host flowers are native species are only present on the landscape. For many of these native bees, my garden will never provide the, ha the same type of habitat as our nearby intact grasslands. Therefore, even as we rethink the choices we make in our gardens, we need to make sure to leave enough protected areas for our specialist bees. But my garden is part of the world. 
Today am I, I am resolved to not just plant bee-friendly cultivated species, but to make as much space as possible for native species that have long been found part of our, our, our region's vegetation that can support the native fauna of bees and other insects. Right now in my garden, natural species make up less than 10% of the genera I counted. Can I make it 20 or even 30%? Our gardens are home to those wondrous alien beings called plants, organisms that breathe without lungs, that gossip on the wind, that know the fidelity demanded by roots, that paint the world in flower colors. The more we can see these beings for what they are and the roles they play in every given ecosystem, rather than just seeing them as the green backdrop to our lives, the more we can cultivate care in our garden. Every garden tells a story. What story can your garden tell? I want to thank you all for joining me for this talk. And I've also wanted to identify here that this is a list of the key references um, that I've used as I've changed my thinking about my garden over the past 15 years. And just to end, I'd like to say be safe and plant well.